THE ELECTORAL PROCESS The first step in viewing the presidency is looking at the nature of the electoral process. Future lessons will deal with the political process of the primary system and nominating convention. Once nominated, the outcome of the election in general is, is generally determined by whomever receives the most electoral votes. The potential for a third-party candidate drawing enough votes to throw the election into the House of Representatives exists. When Ross Perot received almost 20% of the popular vote in 1992 and established his own political party, many political scientists predicted that in a future presidential election, no candidate would receive a majority of the electoral votes. Two factors contribute to this threat. First, the rules of the electoral college system in, uh, dictate that the winner takes all the electoral votes of a state, even if one candidate wins 51% of the vote and the losing candidate gets 49%. Second, the allocation of electoral votes does not always reflect true population and voter patterns. California, with 55 electoral votes, has approximately one vote for each 550,000 people, whereas Alaska has three electoral votes for approximately 183,000 people based on the 2000 census. On four occasions in American history, presidential candidates have lost the election even though they received the most popular votes. In 1824, Andrew Jackson received the popularity vote and um, the plurality of popular votes and electoral votes over 40% of the popular votes to 31% of the vote obtained by John Quincy Adams. Yet, yet Jackson did not receive a majority of the electoral votes. Adams received a majority of the votes from the House and was elected president. In 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes lost the popular vote by little more than 275,000 votes. Called the stolen election by historians, Hayes received an electoral majority after an electoral commission was set up by Congress to investigate electoral irregularities in Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Oregon. The commission voted on party lines, and Hayes was officially elected president. In 1888, Grover Cleveland won the popular vote, but lost the electoral majority to Benjamin Harrison. In the 2000 election, Vice President Al Gore received more popular votes than George W. Bush. Bush, however, won the majority of electoral votes and became our 43rd president. If third-party candidate Ralph Nader had not run, Gore would have, enough, uh, would have won enough electoral votes to have won the election. Even though this has occurred only four times, there have been extremely close elections, such as the 1960 election between Kennedy and Nixon, and the 1976 election between Carter and Ford, where a small shift in one state could have changed the outcome of the election. There is also a potential constitutional problem if a designated presidential elector decides not to vote for the candidate he has committed to support. They are called faithless electors. That happened on nine occasions without having an impact on the outcome. The third anomaly of the system could take place if the House and Senate must determine the outcome of the election. The Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution outlines this procedure, and even though it has happened only once, strong third-party candidates make this a distinct possibility in the future. Elections in 1912, the Bull Moose candidacy of Theodore Roosevelt, 1968, the American Independent Party candidacy of George Wallace, and the recent candidacy of Ross Perot all influenced campaign strategy. Two proposed constitutional amendments have been offered to make the system fairer. The first one would create a proportional system so that a candidate gets the proportional number of electoral votes based on the size of the popular vote received in the state. A second plan offered would simply abolish the electoral college and allow the election to be determined by the popular vote, with perhaps a 40% minimum margin established. Any multi-party race resulting in a victory with less than 40% would create a runoff. Presidential disability and succession are defined by the 25th Amendment. It allows the vice president to become acting president after the president's camp cabinet confirms that the president is disabled. This happened for a short period when Ronald Reagan was undergoing surgery after a, an assassination attempt. In 1996, a self-appointed panel of 50 experts, including three White House doctors, issued a report which established the criteria for declaring a president impaired and unable to perform the job of the presidency. The recommendations included 1. A transfer of power contingency plan implemented prior to the President's inauguration. 2. The use of the President's personal doctor to make recommendations related to the health of the President. 3. A determination of what constitutes impairment be based on a medical evaluation. 
4. The determination of when a president cannot serve be made by constitutional officers. And 5. There should be an accurate disclosure of the president's health, which should balance his right to privacy. Although this, advise, uh, although this report was advisory, President Clinton endorsed it and indicated that he hoped it would be used as a future guideline. The amendment also outlines the procedures for selecting a new vice president when that office becomes vacant. This happened after Spiro Agnew resigned in 1973. Nine presidents have not completed their terms of office. Eight presidents have died in office, and one, Nixon, resigned. After Franklin Roosevelt died in 1945, a constitutional amendment limited the term of office to no more than two consecutive terms. There has been a growing movement to further limit presidential terms to one six-year term to reduce the amount of time and energy devoted to raising campaign funds and the time it takes to campaign for office.